Fantastic. Um, now I'm very happy to introduce Carrie Norman, one half of the architectural firm Norman Kelly. Uh, as I mentioned before, Thomas Kelly uh, couldn't join us today. Um, but it's been a real pleasure to work with both of them on this project. And it's, it's been truly a collaboration. So I, I would just like to say that they, they were really instrumental in helping us develop some of the curatorial ideas for the show. So it was kind of a, a perfect match. Um, so I'm really pleased that Carrie will be able to talk a little bit um, about their own practice, but also specifically about the ideas in developing the architectural design. Well, first off, obviously, thank you so much to Irene Sunwu and Tiffany Lambert uh, for inviting us here today. We're so honored and humbled uh, to be participating in this event. Um, we are by far the least experienced and familiar with Arakawa and Gins uh, uh, of the participants here. Uh, so we thought um, we'd discuss uh, that sort of how that neutrality sort of tempered the, our approach to the collaboration um, on this project and how that sort of neutrality tempers um, collaborations with, with other artists that we've designed or collaborated on exhibitions for. Um, and it's, it's incredibly exciting to be a part of, of this event and this exhibition, which really marks an important occasion. Um, in which this work uh, and these, these artists can, can reach an architectural community and an architectural audience. I think that's wonderful. Um, so to begin, we uh, thought we'd start off by sharing a little about our approach to collaborations on projects like Eternal Gradient um, that aim to operate in the background, um, that are accessory to something larger. So if architecture we're a double act. Norman Kelly strives to be the straight man. Take, for example, a comedy duo in which two differing personalities and sets of behaviors perform a comedy routine together, but from contradictory angles. One performer, the straight man or stooge, may have no comedic purpose, but to act in a manner that makes the actual comic look good. Usually the straight man's form of comedy is serious, nearly skeptical, so allowing the audience's perception of the actual comic's act to appear more ridiculous or shocking for heightened affect. Examples include Jerry Lewis and Dean Martin, Abbott and Costello. Architectural equivalents might include Lily Reich and Mies, uh, or Boss Prinzen in Office, or Joseph Michael Gandhi and uh, Sir John Sohn. So in the examples that follow, um, Norman Kelly is the straight man and woman. Uh, our aim is to make the comic, I mean artists here, uh, we're working with to look good. We accept our role like an architect is often required to do, which is listen and interpret. Um, and it's a role we're very fond of, replaying when the comic's work is so good. So in January of this year, we were invited to collaborate with the performance artist Brendan Fernandez, the Chicago-based Canadian artist of Kenyan and Indian descent, for an exhibition titled Master and Form, currently on view at the Graham Foundation through April 5th, which will be the last performance. So if anybody finds themselves in Chicago this week, I highly recommend uh, seeing it. Um, installations and performances such as Master and Form and Eternal Gradient are incredible opportunities to expand our disciplinary discourse and work within the physical spaces of found rooms. In this case, the installation gives audience members an intimate vantage point of ballet dancers from the Joffrey Academy of Dance as they move through training objects and room scale interventions. The show explores themes of mastery, masochism, and ideal form within the culture of ballet through the use of designed objects that enable dancers to perform and extend iconic ballet positions. 
And here you can see a little bit of our working method with Brendan. Um, uh, on the left, his initial sketch. In the middle, our sort of digital translation. And on the right, a photograph of dancer Andrea de Leon holding in camber on the ground pose. If you look closely, uh, where each object contacts the body is wrapped in leather. The collaboration involved research uh, with Brendan that took us to the Leather Archives and Museum in Rogers Park, Chicago, a place dedicated to the preservation of leather, kink, and fetish lifestyles. At the opening, you could find leather daddies and ballet enthusiasts mingling. Occupying the first and second floor galleries of the Madliner House, the installation must work with dancers absent. At these times, frames activate the space by drawing out existing architectural elements that relate closely to the body, such as uh, windows and thresholds. In addition to, to being honored and thanking Brendan for his vision, we'd also like to take an opportunity here to thank Ellen Alderman, Ava Barrett, and Sarah Herda for allowing us to experiment yet again on their house. And around the same time, uh, we were also approached by Irene to collaborate on Eternal Gradients exhibition design. So thank you, Irene, for thinking of us. Um, and thank you to, to Betsy Clifton, uh, with whom we closely collaborated on the, this design. This was the first time uh, our collaboration with the curator included being present during the selection of the work. So here we are at the giant art storage uh, facility. I think you can see Moako and Stephen in the in the background. Um, and uh, and here you see Irene and Tiffany inspecting a bridge drawing uh, and performing what we imagine is the most challenging task of a curator, which is making the selections. In the end, nearly forty drawings were selected, including these, which. Um, stood out in our mind uh, as they introduced human figures uh, wrestling sort of these spatial and material impossibilities. And in many of their spatial experiments uh, of the work within this particular kind of era, uh, like this sketch for their uh, bridge project, um, and to which I should add our design is sort of heavily indebted, and I hope you'll see soon why, uh, is this idea of the container, again, that has been mentioned, um, as illustrated here with this sort of gridded mesh structure, um, used as a physical device sort of for, I suppose, measuring and navigating perception. And in our research, we also came across this photo of an exhibition that Arakawa actually designed. And to engage the work on the wall, uh, one needed to climb ramps at different steepness. So here, perception is both a visual and physical exercise, and it required work. You can um, see in the distance there are ropes. Those are to help you climb the ramp. Um, and our hope in the design is to extend this affinity for active viewing. So what we've come up with is a sort of false enfilade plan um, of centralized display structures. In this case, views are passed through the center rather than circulation, um, which recalls a bit uh, of some of the themes we've, we've seen so far um, in which uh, maybe only a child could walk through the center. Um, and upon entering the gallery and arriving to the center axis, one can see through the entire length of the exhibition. So all artworks are placed on the east and west walls of the display structures to really maintain that visibility. In three dimensions, the mesh structures recall some of their drawn counterparts while adding vertical and horizontal display surfaces. And this is what we're calling the sort of 41st drawing that we've smuggled into the show. Uh, it's an anamorphic drawing uh, installed with dark gray vinyl below the mesh structures, uh, which reenacts the sort of impossible spatial conditions present in, in their work 
um, and uh, also reconstructs one of the sketches shown earlier. As one shifts to either side of the gallery, or as if you are looking at it from eye height, the two-dimensional deceit uh, is easily revealed. And the plan of the drawing that measures approximately 15 and a half feet long by eight feet wide. Perhaps the closest our design approaches the physical demands thematic to Arakawa and Ginz's spatial experiments actually occurred in the labor to produce the exhibition. Uh, for the vinyl, a team of 12 people patiently weeded the surface over the course of several days prior to install. For those unfamiliar with the term, weeding is the term for the process of removing unwanted material, and it's a manual process performed by hand. The labor of the install also included some heavy lifting, and we are very thankful to our fabricators, Navalis out of Chicago, and uh, to Josh Jordan, to Yoon Kang, to Karen Choi, to Ben Gillis, and to Alex Prince Wright for their assistance in the process. Um, we invite you to, to crouch and to find the hidden drawing. Uh, like the work of Arakawa Gins, it resists passive viewing, and so it does not reveal itself immediately. If you are patient, uh, we recommend, if you are impatient, I should say, we recommend letting your camera be the viewfinder. Here a shot of the vinyl floor drawing installed. At the same time, um, there are other moments that require far less work, like this window. that was intentionally designed to frame a very specific drawing in the near distance. Or to, say, put two other projects in dialogue with each other. Um, and so the talk began with the term accessory. Hopefully it's clear that we prefer a self-effacing set of architectural services. In short, we relied on smart people uh, to circumscribe smart contexts. Uh, and then really our job was easy. We just listened closely and tried to play it straight. exhibitions to join me at the table with Carrie for a short chit chat um, about our experiences. I think we have some questions for each other probably even though we've been in, trapped inside the gallery for about two weeks together, <laughs> focusing on, on things other than the concepts behind the design. Uh, thank you. I think we have some slides too to go on behind us. Um, maybe I'll start just by asking Carrie, um, because you, like me, came to the work without prior knowledge, right? So I was just wondering, as an architect and also as an educator, just what your initial response was to seeing the breadth of work, mm -hmm. because you, you clearly mm -hmm. did your research and preparation, looking at the paintings, the sculptures, and even the later works. Sure, um, it's, I think as has been mentioned, incredibly, um, a lot of the work is opaque and a lot of uh, the, the range is a bit overwhelming. So at a certain point, you kind of had to cut off references anymore. You kind of had to just like, kind of isolate a, a couple instances to really look uh, a lot closer at. Um, and that's where you guys became incredibly invaluable in the process. Um, continually uh, keeping us updated on the kind of current checklist and the selection of the work. Um, and I'm just incredibly impressed with, um, in a short time period, how um, such a tight selection of work happens. Um, throughout the process, uh, certain sort of tendencies seem to kind of keep creeping up. Um, 
as an architect, we kept looking at opportunities to frame it on terms of architecture. So we sort of started with thinking through the plan. Uh, how could the plan be an organizing device? And, and maybe not as obvious in the show, that was a sort of um, uh, recurring theme played out in our Colligan's uh, spatial experiments. So uh, we sort of identified a strategy um, that then could hopefully absorb um, changes in scale, changes in scope, uh, changes in size as the work sort of continually evolved to be uh, more, the selection process could be more refined and so forth. Um, in our Cowlingen's work uh, from this period in particular, they're kind of searching for uh, a visual representation for their ideas. And I was curious how, if you could talk a little bit more about how you as the architect kind of approached that um, idea of finding your own visual and physical representation of somebody else's work. It's a great question. Um, I mean, uh, maybe a shared affinity between our practice and the tendencies in their representation, particularly within this era that is represented in the show, is the idea of the grid. Um, and so that was a sort of, mm, I don't want to say easy selection, but it lent itself to ways in which we work rigorously with kind of alignments and um, are sort of obsessive about uh, measurements and precision and tolerance and so forth. Um, it was funny last night when uh, a particular uh, visitor was looking at some of the, the screen valves um, opposite the entry and uh, regarded them as sort of geometric experiments. Um, and what's kind of most fascinating about them is that they're actually, they're pretty literal spatial uh, drawings. Um, and so while they present themselves abstractly, they are meant to be looked at very literally. Um, and, and maybe our approach to this design uh, is a bit literal in its sort of uh, mimicking of that process. So if you have questions for us, we don't need to grill you <laughs> up here. Two on one. I love to, I love to pick your guys' brains on how you go about um, making selections. That really must be the hardest part of this. And there's probably no easy response. No. Um, <laughs> well, time, a time frame, a deadline definitely <laughs> helps. Um, but, I mean, as I kind of tried to explain a little bit at the beginning, there was this whittling down, so at a certain point, there was a realization that the, the digital material was kind of a world of its own. And in order to do it justice, it, I think it would have needed much more time. Mm -hmm. and also, technological resources, really sifting through files and identifying which printout preceded another one. Um, so I could see that, that that was quite an overwhelming project in and of itself. So. Landing on the hand drawings was kind of a beautiful moment of serendipity. Uh, but even within those, um, I mean, I should say that the, the research, it was happening really simultaneously. There were some things I didn't realize about some of the projects until after we had selected them. So there were just a lot of happy accidents as well. Um, but being able to identify certain clear projects like the Venice container for mind blank body, also the bridge is a clear project, and things like the screen valves are clear projects, but there were ways to, to find connections between these things, and you know, it, it's because we're dealing with a quite contained period of time that um, you can tease out those things, and because you have the visual material, you know, sometimes I would just see two drawings across the room, and I just look back and forth, it's like, now I get it. <laughs> So it's that, that kind of beauty of having images uh, to actually look at and really unpack very, very slowly. Um, and then uh, with the archival material as well, like these 
Polaroids, you know, had been found, uh, I guess, sometime in December or November, and I couldn't always make out what the projects were, but after revisiting uh, some of the drawings over and over again, I began to see, like, ah, uh, this is that, and this is what they meant by um, this container, and, and even just realizing that this term container was a mm -hmm. really strong aspect of their vocabulary. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's not, it's not like a neat answer for okay. you, but um, having some of those limits certainly helped and being enthusiastic about the visual strength of a lot of the material, um, that was a, a real driving force. Um, this emphasis on drawing, mm -hmm. uh, which also has to do with, you know, contemporary discussions right now and you know for for anybody in the field we know that there's been a lot of drawing exhibitions recently um, and kind of uh, interest in the period just up until the digital mm -hmm. let's mm -hmm. say um, thinking back to the 90s um, but but also you know and Focusing on the 80s, it was also an opportunity to introduce names into that historical discourse that have thus far been, I would say, like pretty completely overlooked uh, in terms of that decade. Let, let's say in the 2000s, Arakawa and Madeline were quite vocal. They were out there uh, campaigning for themselves, but somehow this material kind of fell behind. Yeah, just to add to that, for me, I had Heard a little bit about their work um, a few when Madeline passed away, actually, uh, but it was their architectural built work. So I was fascinated by this past history of artworks for Arakawa um, and poetry, which I had no idea existed from Madeline, and just kind of thinking like, how did they go from there to there? And that sort of experience of uncovering that narrative of their biography was super fascinating to me, in um, in particular. Yeah, because in, in the research process, what I found was that I could find people that knew about the later work, the digital drawings, had worked in the offices, and then other people who were quite familiar with the paintings and even the literature, but mm -hmm. there was this zone in between um, that was a little bit of a mystery, and I, I think it's still a little bit of a mystery, <laughs> even though we, we've done a whole show focused particular, particularly on this period. Um, but you know, my hope is that this is a point of departure for other people, scholars, architects, whoever, mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. kind of jump in and you know, maybe for someone interested in painting, seeing some of this material um, informs something of their intelligence about the 60s or says something different about Mitaka lofts or any of these other later built works. Mm. For, for drawings that are to be considered by or received by an architectural audience, they're incredibly open, right? Um, and we could, maybe, maybe hard to imagine, but, but possibly plausible, um, uh, imagine that maybe in 20 or 30 years that an architecture exhibition uh, wouldn't would not contain drawings because of the softwares that we're using mm. uh, makes drawings all equivalent. They're all looking the same, right? And so mm. there is no openness to them anymore. So I, I, I find this to be like incredibly exciting to, to focus on the openness that <coughs> still remains, that's still potential, it's still latent within that tool, that medium for, for architects. Hmm. I was actually going to ask you something about that. Um, I don't know how much time we have left, but we can make, what's that? Keep that. <laughs> can make it quick. Um, the end point of the show, and just to sort of riff on their philo one of their philosophies is like how the beginning is the end and the end is the beginning. Um, so it's also the first thing you see in the show is their latest works, which are the three lobby reproductions that you'll see in the gallery, um, which are the digital that I, Irene mentioned earlier, these digital computer um, software aided drawings that they made. Um, and so I was just curious, um, which represent the sort of turn to the digital that Arakawa and Madeline um, did in the early 90s, these are from 1991. Um, and I was wondering as an architect, um, what you would say 
uh, or an architect knowing about their work, um, what you would envision um, their interpretation to be uh, with new digital tools today, like VR, for example, seems like it has potential for some of their theoretical ideas. I just wondered working on the show if you had considered that or what hmm. you thought they would, how they would interpret that, I guess. I think that that question would need to resolve whether or not they desire their work to be understood <laughs> and that they want, <laughs> right? Because the VR and, and that like mode of representation is, is not open. I mean, that's very closed in a way, right? Um, and the, the digital reproductions do uh, present themselves in a way to be read quite uh, clearly, right? It doesn't leave a lot um, uh, to like uh, question, to, to, to mediate on, um, meditate on. Um, and so I, I, it would be hard to like, uh, Try to put thoughts, you know. Try to try to understand what they what their position would be. Um, from the works that are in the show, I would. They're 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 particularly like uh, effective uh, to me as an architect reading them um, because of that openness. And I I would say like I would hate to see their work in VR, mm. even though they might desire that. I don't know. Um, could you talk about the, um, how you responded to the constraints and opportunities of the, the space of the gallery a little? Because um, I feel like, well, I have some thoughts about that, but mm -hmm. maybe you could talk about that a bit. Some of their projects, uh, at least some of the plans of projects that we were able to locate, um, mm -hmm. Though maybe at first glance appeared very complex, uh, really did reduce to like the four cardinal directions, and I think um, Muako might have men mentioned that. Or uh, at any rate, like there is a kind of understanding between um, a relationship between the center and the periphery um, that we tried to maintain. Um, so in the, in, when you're in the gallery, you sort of always have a clear reference, an understanding uh, sort of your position um, in space relative to the center, relative to the edge. Um, and uh, we're excited by uh, moments in which you can um, afford a kind of farther, uh, more distance from the work. Um, and then there are moments that you are like uncomfortably close to the work. So playing with that kind of friction really excited us. Um, yeah. There was just one comment that slipped my mind, but now I just <laughs> wanted to, to bring it up that it, it was quite interesting in the research process um, and this kind of has to do with a, a more big picture comment about where we situate the work today, because uh, these projects have been kind of squarely outside of historiography, uh, but perhaps there will be more scholarship coming. Um, but it was interesting to find in the research process that there were not explicit ties to other contemporary practices or even historical practices. So when I was having a conversation uh, with a journalist a few weeks ago, I was saying to him, you know, I was kind of hoping there would be a magical folder that said architectural yeah. precedents <laughs> and there would be a bibliography and I could cross-reference to their library because that's been inventoried. And there was no such thing. And, and may maybe there is one because I couldn't go through every single box. Uh, but in a way, I think it was telling in that it seems to me that they really came to architecture in their own terms. Mm -hmm. So without historical baggage, not having to reference Palladio or Peter Eisenman or, or whoever, even though they were very much part of the New York scene at that time, like it's been really remarkable to 
mention the project to someone and they say, oh yeah, I worked in their office or I worked on that model and I was part of that project or I invited Madeline to a review at GSAP, which apparently she, she did a few times. Um, I think Ed Keller was the one, one of a few that maybe invited her. Uh, so it's been really kind of strange, but also refreshing to see that someone could so robustly engage with the discipline totally freely and you know uh, that had its benefits and also its drawbacks mm -hmm. but um, yeah I'm just curious Carrie for you like you're very very interested in architectural history so when you kind of first encountered the work like what are the things that came to mind for you because I immediately thought of Kiesler uh, mm -hmm. And you know a handful of other other names, but I could never make those connections. But at a certain point, just kind of let it go. <laughs> right. I mean, uh, maybe this is extreme, but uh, I think Thomas and I consider ourselves a bit like right wing architectural disciplinarians, <laughs> um, of which uh, Arakawa and Gins are squarely not. <laughs> um, and. Yeah, when you mentioned this show and I looked up their work, um, you know, the first the first return on the search is the is the is the built work. Um, and what's striking is how um, how much contrast there is between the built work and then the kind of drawings or the spatial experiments through drawing that preceded the built work. Mm -hmm. um, and I I don't know. I would li love to know more about that kind of. Uh, scale jump that happened in the work and why there is such a disconnect um, formally um, that happens. And I think that, you know, if you asked five architects, uh, it would probably be a split response of whether they considered these, these artists architects or were they just approaching sort of architectural uh, work, right? Um, it's hard to say. I mean, I think that we would fall along the lines that they're not architects, but the scale of space, the, the, the spatial experiments, the physical experiment uh, was, was, you know, just among the kind of scale that they took on. Um, and at a certain point, uh, the, the darling could not um, surface their kind of aspiration, um, and so they had to build. Um, but I, it's outside of architecture for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tiffany, what do you think? <laughs> I had the same problem looking through. I kept trying to make associations with the, especially their uh, interpretation of space and the body in the space. So I kept thinking of like psychogeography and like this idea of drifting and situation is international. And, on since Babylon, I think I was talking to Andres a little bit about it the other day. Um, but we had a whole list of what was in their library. So I was mm -hmm. like, oh yes, that's where I'm going to find it. And none of them were there mm -hmm. <laughs> at all. So I, I found it really confounding and also really interesting that they were working amongst people in architecture dealing with some similar sort of issues. Um, obviously working for our show within um, a postmodernist idiom uh, modernist to postmodernist, except theirs is very different. Um, and so I feel like they arrived at um, some similar but very different ideas. Mm. Yeah, I think maybe with Carrie at one point a few weeks ago, or it might have, I can't remember. A day ago? Was it. There are so many people we <laughs> were talking to. Um, but it, it's yeah. interesting that they kind of approach architecture as a medium, purely, mm -hmm. and then it, it's the theoretical that they're able to mm -hmm. kind of articulate through that medium itself. Yeah, I find their work to be, I mean, of course, like, I'm just, this is a, an opinion, like, to be just, like, practical theory, practical philosophy or something, right? Like, the built work is not to be, in my mind, read architecturally. Mm. It's kind of a residue of the ideas, mm -hmm. in a way. Mm -hmm. But I feel like you embrace that with the design, in a way. This, like, expanding of the mind into the space and especially with that nice moment that you talked about in the show smuggling in the 
the 41st <laughs> drawing, uh, this nice moment where the two-dimensional graphics become multi-dimensional with mm -hmm. the mesh mm -hmm. structures mm -hmm. in a 3D space um, when you get at a certain actually kind of awkward and uncomfortable crouch mm -hmm. position, mm -hmm. um, but you only have to do it for a second to realize it, uh, so it's worth doing if you haven't already. Um, anyway, um, I think it's really interesting where you sort of embrace this idea of changing perception and coercing the body into a certain set of challenging positions um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the actual uh, display of the exhibition itself. So I kind of saw that connection too. I think to define the, the line between that separates architecture from something that's architectural is incredibly hard. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of our work is architectural and we're still kind of defining what is architecture to us. And I think, you know, that's maybe a, a long pursuit. Um, and so there, I obviously didn't mean any value, you know, any judgment when I, when I called them architectural and not architects, because I would call myself architectural, maybe not architect. <laughs> Uh, right, so I think it's a, it's, it's a tricky distinction that maybe only architects find interest in even kind of unpacking also. Mm. Um. Well, I think that's a great way to close. Uh, thanks so much, it was great to, to hear you uh, walk through the project even though I've been literally walking through it and also <laughs> to, to acknowledge all the physical labor that you went through and I don't know if you guys noticed but that was Carrie weeding the vinyl uh, in it. that slide. <laughs> I pitched in, I didn't do all of it. <laughs> okay, great, thank you, thank you guys.